Teal, it is such an honor to welcome you to the Soul Collective. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. Yeah. Uh, I want to dive right in and ask you, you know, in the spiritual community, there's a big emphasis on love and light and focusing on what you want to manifest. But what do you feel is the value in embracing and leaning into our triggers? Oh, everything. I mean, most people are living their lives in a state of aversion. It's like most of us, if we look at our lives and what it is that we're wanting, we're looking to get away from something, right? So we're in this constant perpetual cycle of runaway and suppress and reject and deny and disown. And the problem is we're in this, this time space reality that's managed by the law of mirroring, something that many people are calling the law of attraction. So it doesn't actually work that way. Whenever we're in a state of avoidance, we get more of the very thing that we're running away from. So by turning around, you know, flipping in the direction of that, that thing that we're running away from and by learning how to integrate those things and really go through the feelings around those things, we get into a vibration where we actually do, you know, uh, step into a space of attracting what we want to attract and making different decisions. I mean, quite frankly, when we're not running away from all this great content and what we could call the shadow self, we're going to attract a whole different life. We're going to make different decisions in our life. So it's like the game changer of all game changers. Yeah. And I always remind myself that expansion follows contraction and, you know, there's always so much gold on the other side, if you're just willing to allow it to take its course. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, like as a young child, I know that you had clairvoyance and a lot of ex extra sensory abilities. What was that like for you? Did you have an awareness that some of your gifts were different from other children? Well, it was, it was hell, honestly. Like I would love to sugarcoat it, but it was absolutely awful. If I was going to be honest. Um, I was raised in an, an area of the globe that's super uber religious. And so it's, it's a culture that understands the spiritual stuff, but they don't understand it in the way that say I would explain it. They understand it through the lens of, of their doctrine. And so <clears throat> it was not received well <laughs> at all. And like most kids, you just assume that everybody's having kind of the same experience that you're having. And then you you have certain experiences that teach you quite the opposite. So there were times where several times at school where I would be talking about the things that I was perceiving and the looks that I would get were of absolute horror. You know, I, I was sent to the principal's office for this. So very early on, I understood that what I was going through is very different. And therefore, the way that I saw the world was very different. And I was going to have to try to figure out and navigate the world that they saw if I wasn't going to get myself in huge trouble. Did you have anybody at that time to really like help you navigate through your gifts? None. I had no one. And and what was worse than that is my predicament of, of having these abilities and not really knowing what to do with them and being caused absolute misery because of just the bombardment of information, not knowing how to manage any of that was exploited by a man in town who was interested in these kinds of things, but who was a sexual predator. So it was the man who stepped in as a mentor for me on this level was the very person who took advantage of me the worst in my life for a lot of years, 13 years straight. It was not a good situation. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like, you know, one of the many reasons why people can relate to you is your no nonsense approach and and also just like you being so open um, and sharing about your abuse and the trauma that you suffered as a child. And, you know, if there is somebody that is experiencing that right now, like what what advice would you have to navigate that? Um. Well, I mean, I feel like everything that I have put out there in some way caters towards people who are struggling with deep levels of trauma, right? Something that I would definitely offer that's different than what most people would say is it's not about getting away from the feelings. Like when we have these intense triggers, those triggers are in fact asking for your assistance. They're calling you into whatever is unresolved. The problem though is when you've gone through such severe abuse the feelings that you're going to have to be integrating are so, so far beyond the range of intense when compared to the trauma, say, that other people will be having to um, integrate that. It's like, I don't want to downplay this, 
how extreme it feels, you know? There's a difference between, oh, you know, my friend when I was at this age rejected me and I have to sit with those feelings and I was raped when I was six and I have to sit with those feelings. It's a whole different caliber. It's a whole different level. I can definitely say that that um, anybody who opted into that has the capacity to hold those emotions, but it's tormenting. And it's a really painful process that will definitely not go very well if what you're trying to do is to escape the triggers or escape the way you feel. I think this is where a lot of what I'm doing is differing from a lot of the people in the mainstream is I'm saying, actually, you know, your whole system is calling you back there because so much of it is unresolved. That means you have to go back and actually create resolution. It's the last thing you want to do. Like, I understand this more than anyone. <laughs> I mean, look at me. I went into professional sports. I got out of my whole situation and was like, don't ever with a 10 foot pole ever. I'm never setting foot in that town. I'm never going near those people. I'm never smelling that smell. So we essentially develop this entire MO that's complete aversion, understandably so. Mm. so. But you get to a point when you're dealing with trauma healing where you've got to go, you know what? That big, dark, deep hole there is making up a lot of the content of my being still. Mm. And I need to go back there and not, not go back alone. So... <laughs> Yeah. I haven't heard you talk much in in interviews about the period in your life when you were a professional skater, Mm -hmm. um, skier, you know, was speed an element of like escaping or like, what was that period like for you? I love this. I love that you took me here because you're right. Nobody has interests because in the spiritual field, you're like, oh, I was an athlete. They're like, that's great. But tell me about other stuff. Yeah. Um, I loved that time period of my life, honestly. It was all about discipline and having to confront different challenges in order to excel. I mean, it's ironic because you kind of see a smaller version of what I'm doing intentionally every day, all day long with self-growth, but within the context of competition, you find out quite quick in your athletic career that it's really not physical blockages that are preventing you from excelling in your sport. It's mental and emotional blockages. So, you know, you run away to be like, oh no, (laughs) I can't avoid myself. Um, So it was a lot of that, like just meeting challenges and then breaking through the next level and how good that felt and really not having any money. Because let's be honest, like in America, if you're like the top three, you're making really great money, um, but everyone else is starving to death. So I was definitely not impressing anybody enough to be um, doing well. So it was like trying to make ends meet and living with tons of roommates. And um, it was really warm though, because like, when you're an athlete and everybody else that's around you is also an athlete, you get each other because you're, you've all got this goal and you have no idea whether you're ever going to achieve it, even though you are throwing every ounce of everything into it. Like that has to be the ultimate priority or you don't stand a chance. And so you're looking at each other at the end of the day, you've both been sweating bullets for six and a half hours and you're like, why don't we get a box of cake and just like eat it all by ourselves? You know? <laughs> um, I loved that. And um another thing that I just loved was this like relationship that I had with the winter elements most especially the mountain because even though I did you know end up switching into speed skating skiing is and will be forever my thing right and in those first years when I escaped from my abuse to doing that I found the safety in these snow-covered mountains that I had never tasted anywhere else and it's kind of odd to call it safety because it's a kind of a dangerous safety it feels a little bit like you're um, like hugging yourself up to a, a dragon because mm-hmm. th- those mountains they decide who they want to keep alive mm-hmm. so it's like very much this edgy feeling but it's like if you endear yourself to the mountain it's like you sell a piece of your soul I feel like the only people who are going to get this are like really hardcore skiers but the, the best skiers in the world you sell your soul to the snow-covered mountain mm-hmm. the same way that the surfer does to the ocean and you're basically making this con- you're doing this contract which is very you know subconscious and emotional, which is like, you get to decide whether I live or die. Mm. And in exchange, I'm going to honor you and I'm going to spend my life with you. And it's this crazy symbiosis with, with like, you know, the element that is the winter and with the mountain itself. And I just, I've never lost that feeling. It's an aspect of spirituality that most people never taste unless they've been in those types of spaces. 
And I just love that. I love that so much. I dream about it all the time. And on top of that, that time period was so much exercise. I mean, so much exercise that I was getting fevers at nighttime. It's like your whole body breaks down. It's not normal or natural to do that amount of exercise at that level of intensity. So <laughs> you're, and it's, it's like your body feels different. It's like, you feel like a racehorse. Every inch of you just feels like somebody took a chisel. It's like, you know, it's pretty physically powerful. One, one might observe in looking at you that there's a, a level of intensity and drive and success yeah. for whatever you kind of put your heart and soul into. Do you feel like you were predestined for fame? Yes, absolutely. What's interesting is when I'm watching myself, even when I'm looking back at, at um, home videos from when I was really young, you definitely see this rage for excellence and a rage for mastery that only makes sense in the context of, you know, being in the top spot that you can possibly be in, which involves some element of attention, right? So w watching myself when I was young, it's not a surprise at all that I have been here. In fact, it does feel like, it, I mean, everything that comes naturally was built for this. Hmm. It's like, I, I never had a problem with stages, loved cameras from day one, like, don't have any issue with this kind of stuff. So in that way, yeah, like definitely destined for fame, but there are definitely elements of fame that, that I don't feel cut out for at all. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you about that because I feel like in our society, fame is so glorified. And what yeah. would you say in, in terms of like spiritual development that is necessary to be able to, you know, handle what comes with fame? Fame is a magnifying glass. So what it does is it takes every single thing that you're already struggling with and it magnifies it by a thousand and a half. So if you're dealing with trust issues in your relationship, which believe me you are, otherwise you probably wouldn't have the drive for fame in the first place, those trust issues are going to get magnified. Um, if if what you're dealing with is low self-esteem or self-criticism, what you're going to be a match to in the public eye is criticism on a, on a worldwide level. So where where people really start to fall into the pitfalls of fame is when they run into the magnification of the very things that they couldn't handle that drove them to fame. Hmm. You know, like you even see this in Marilyn Monroe's life. There's a, there's a deep, you know, sense of isolation. So trying to fill the void of isolation with the adoration of fans only to find yourself more lonely than you've ever been before in your life. I've never in my life spoken to somebody who's famous that hasn't said this is exactly what happened to them. And then, so it's like, you're up against your demon magnified. And it, the question is, are you going to survive it? Are you going to end up in rehab? Are you going to end up committing suicide? I mean, it's, it's a level of intensity that is so extreme that if, if most people were a match to that level of extreme life, they would be there. There's a reason why, you know, most people, when they hit that level, they're like, no, 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 no. You know? Do you feel like you've done fame in other lifetimes before? Oh yeah. No, I know. I know it for a fact I have. Mm -hmm. just the game is very different now than it was before there's less reverence mm -hmm. it's i don't I, I to be honest with you i dislike fame in this life more so than i have in my previous lives makes sense yeah it's like the, the generation we could call it the millennial and the gen z generation are destroying uh celebrity well That's, everything's under a microscope right and it's well, just what it is, they, people don't really like hierarchies They've been wounded by them. The millennial and Gen Z generation has been wounded by hierarchy. Therefore, they don't want anyone on top of them. And the whole thing about, you know, celebrities was, oh, my gosh, you're like up there on a pedestal and you're like a god. And so what's happening is that, you know, these younger generations are tearing those pedestals down, saying, whatever, I can do what you can do. Look, I just got five million followers on my Instagram account type of thing. And that sort of energy of like, there's no such thing as a glorified star. And yet being famous, you're going to suffer all the consequences just the same means that there's very little perks, hmm. very, very high consequences. Yeah. We were chatting a little bit before, you know, about astrology. And I'd love to know if there's anything about your astrological chart that particularly resonates. Oh, there's like a whole ton. You mean like about my personality in general? Yeah. Yeah, like all kinds of things. I'm, I'm the kind of person who can find a lot of truth in, in any of these um, ideologies because it's just different like lenses through which to see yourself. One of the things that struck me um, recently as, as being something that was very true is that my North Node, I think if I'm right, it's my North Node is in Aries. And that's supposed to be in terms of marketing how you present yourself. So it's been really interesting because, you know, me in the business world, um, 
people who are into astro astrology and business are always like, you have to market a person according to their North node. Otherwise they will be perceived as inauthentic. Right. So I'm, I'm looking at this because on the team, we're constantly like, what colors should we use? And what kind of MO should Teal have? And what font? And all that kind of crap, you know, that goes on behind the scenes. It's not the actual content that I do. And it's like interesting to watch all these people trying to sort of play my personality down. Like you mentioned my intensity, right? And a lot of people are like, we need to kind of soften her edge a little bit. But then according to that midheaven, it's like, no, people are going to get sketched out by that. So like, you should be using poppy reds and like, really aggressive headlines so that people don't feel like <laughs> what did I get myself into that's not what I wanted you know so I really did resonate with that when I found out that that was um that was my north node um, another thing is knowing that my my moon is in Aquarius was really interesting because I feel like a complete extraterrestrial with relationships like my I, I have this mentality which is like there's never a limit to the amount of love that I can have so I'm so inclusive that it drives my partner's absolutely nuts like why can't i just get the exclusivity feeling from teal and i'm like what's your problem come to the cuddle puddle you know <laughs> no, but i have that you know aquarius moon is like oh there it is um i also obviously i remember very distinctly remember choosing the exact dates only in june for my birth no matter what parents i was looking for so i'm one of those people that very much was a part of the choice around my whole you know, astrological chart, and especially that 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 sun sign being the um, master of communication, because I knew one of the things that I came down here for was to take these complex, you know, concepts and to be able to just like like laser condense them for people. And thank you, Gemini. That is, you know, <laughs> something that I definitely lean on. I have chills like in hearing you say that because it's the first time I've ever heard somebody like so clearly describe that process of like deciding I have to be a Gemini and it makes perfect sense. You talk um, and share so much about relationships. Why is it? Um, why are you so passionate about relationships? I love this question. Um, okay. The reason I'm so passionate about relationships is because relationships are life. If you boil down what life is, it's literally just you perceiving yourself as a separate being therefore in relationship to all other things in existence everything is a relationship you have a relationship with your job you have a relationship with the universe itself you have a relationship with the self you have a relationship with every different person in your life all the objects in your home there is there's nothing in life but relationships now let's take that and set that aside is it that's not big enough okay the next step is Everything that we are struggling with, I mean, everything we're struggling with in the world is down to a failure of relationships. So when when people in the spiritual self-help field say, oh, I teach about relationships, it sounds so like trite, kind of like in the 1980s. I'm a relationship coach. Here's the reality. Ready for it? All crime is a failure of relationship. All war is a failure of relationship. Corporate greed is a failure of relationship. Our political system, which is broken as hell, is a failure of relationship. So the bedrock of our suffering on earth is the failure of relationship. The inability to take the other as a part of the self, the inability to master the art of win-wins, the inability to communicate, it's like a whole list. What's the biggest lie we're told about relationships? No pressure. Okay, so let me think about this. I think, I think the biggest lie that we're sold in relationships is that love is enough to make a relationship work. I know that upsets people because we definitely have this mentality like where there's a will, there's a way, but this is not actually the case when it comes to relationships. It's much more complex and it's much more dependent on things like compatibility. And if you lack compatibility within whatever structure you're trying to build in a relationship, no amount of caring for the other person is going to make up for for that and it can corrode your sense of love for somebody now i know when we use the word love in this context we're using a word that's uh, means very different things to very different people so most people when they use that word you know I, love it means to value somebody or to appreciate them or you know something in that range it they don't mean what i mean when i say love right Believe me, when you have incompatibility issues, it doesn't matter how much you appreciate somebody, you're going to be in so much pain that it's going to slowly corrode mm -hmm. that sensation that you've got towards the person. 
Yeah. I mean, and we have a tendency to kind of like, again, pedestal relationships as like you find the person and it's all, you know, you're set from there and that's just not, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, there's another one too. I've got another one. Yes, yeah, please. That one person can meet all your needs. Yeah. Oh, so good. What's the difference between twin flames and soulmates? Okay, if I was going to split hairs and go according to my definition, I would say that a twin flame is when your soul stream has essentially split and therefore you're meeting a mirror of the self. Very important to understand that the soul stream can split many, many times. So it's a potential that you meet multiple twin flames in a life. Um, when I'm talking about soulmates, which I don't often do, but let's say I was to use that word, what I would be meaning is, is almost like a counterpart or an, or an antidote. So let's say that your soul stream is one that resonates at an incredible intensity and that intensity has been causing problems. And so your expansion path, or even we could say, and I don't mean like a painful expansion path. I'm talking like almost a remedy. Your remedy might be something like calmness. Now we, now we could see the soulmate coming from a soul stream that resonates more at that frequency of calmness. And so it comes in as kind of an antidote. That's why soulmate relationships are so much more pleasant than the twin flame relationships. Okay. When do you know um, it's time to let go in a relationship versus compromise? Okay. When I'm, let's talk about compromise because I'm one of these people who likes to say that you should never compromise in a relationship. I get so much crap for this publicly. <laughs> but it's because when we're using that word compromise, we mean so many different things, right? Most people, when they are talking about compromise, they're talking about the big things. Now, a whole other set of people are talking about the small things. Now, this is where I feel like it's really important to differentiate between the concept of compromise and the concept of workability, two very drastically different concepts. When we are compromising, we're, we're essentially finding a win-win or reaching some kind of a agreement or alignment by virtue of letting go of something that you deeply value. Whereas when we it comes to something like workability, we're trying to achieve that same aim, whatever aim it is, by way of creating a kind of pliability, adaptability, and change. There's no, there's no frequency in workability of giving up of the self. So what's important, why it's important to distinguish between these two is because you can't actually compromise. People think they can, but they actually can't. The reason they can't is that when you give up something of value, it creates a deep, visceral level of pain. That pain is going to come out as things like resentment, things like life dissatisfaction. So when it comes to when do we make that choice, you have to look at, at what you're valuing and what is going to be the outcome of you giving that up. And we really got to be real conscious for this, you know? Like, let's say... You know, a woman gets into a relationship with a man who's like, I'm done having kids. I'm done. Okay, well, she's essentially found herself in a situation where she's she's being asked to compromise if that's important to her. Now, a woman who's like, yeah, I could be workable around that is a woman who in and of herself, she's not really like in a place where she's like, I really deeply value children. She's like, yeah, you know, I could be workable around that because what I get out of it is so worth it, right? But let's say you got a woman who coming into this relationship, she deeply values that that experience of motherhood. And then this man puts her in this position, you know, of having to make that choice. And she's like, okay, because I love you so much, I'm going to compromise on that. Oh, just watch. Her life is going to be every time a stroller goes by misery, you know, every time you know, there's like a Hallmark ad crying, sideways comments, pressure building, it essentially adds up to a life that is going to be pain. So that line should be, can I do this thing and have it be a, yeah, I can sign up for that. Or will I do this thing? And it's going to be, I'm going to be taking pain. It's going to decrease my quality of life. And you're going to know about it mm. eventually in some kind of a backdoor way. And the, like the reason that I can't say for all people where that line should be is because we're all so different you know it's like what one person could be like yeah i can be workable around that and another person would be like oh hell no 
never in a million years, you know? What do you feel like all men get wrong about women? Okay. Um, they have no idea. This is first and foremost. They have no idea how unsafe a woman feels in general in the world. To be honest, though, I, I've been working with women for a while now, and women seem to be unattuned or bypassing how unsafe they feel in the world as well. So it's that's sort of important to know here because someone will be like, I don't know that I feel unsafe. I'm like, oh, yeah, why are we doing this, 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 this and this? But OK, so most men don't understand how unsafe a woman feels in the world. And because of this, he's behaving towards her and towards the world as if she's safe. Um, a lot of the unsafeties that women are facing in today's world are emotional ones. You know, things like, oh my gosh, if we make this decision, then my friend's going to be really upset with me. And if she's upset with me, then all of a sudden I'm in some kind of an emotional conflict. Now, most men don't register that as unsafe, but a woman, oh hell yeah, that's unsafe. So if a man really understands the level of unsafety that a woman is perceiving and is in and gets two steps ahead of her, in terms of that, then he can respond to the unsafety. And when he does that, he's creating a sense of containment and then the woman in his life calms down. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing I would say is that this world is really not conducive to women. And I, I don't think that men really understand that because this world is designed for them, honestly. I mean, I'm not saying it's working for them right now. Right now, the world that we have is not conducive to either gender. However, it is designed for men by men. So it's much more their type of an environment. And if they don't understand that this environment is not one that is made for us, then you know they don't understand the reactions that, that we're having. Yeah. And it's a little bit like, I mean, I'd like to compare it almost to a fish that is almost looking at a jellyfish. Let's say it's a really intense like surf situation. You're right out in the ocean surf. It's tossing and turning. And the fish are like, wee, 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 you know, and they're looking at the jellyfish on top, right? A much more receptive creature that kind of goes with the tides. And they're like, what's your problem? Meanwhile, we're like losing arms. And like, <laughs> there's like a rip. And then we're like, well, you know, upside down. So I feel like it's really important for men to understand that. I think they don't understand that enough about us. Uh, what else? Oh, that heightened emotionality is not a, a marker of lack of intelligence. A lot of men love to equate a sort of lack of logic to emotionality, and they are two completely different sense perceptions with which to experience the world. Um, um, another thing. Oh, most women, this is another thing I'd say. Most women want a man that will be there for her and with her. And that's how they feel a sense of security when most men are kind of focused on, oh, security is about like paying the bills. No, it's actually a very different experience. In fact, women have, a, that's why women seem confusing to men a lot of times is because there's so much wiggle room in what kind of guy they will or won't tolerate or how much money he can or can't make. And she still feels good with him because it's about her perception of him being there for and with her yeah. in that kind of containment. Yeah. Um, Okay, and last thing I'm going to offer, well, I could be here forever, but the last thing I'm going to offer is that I think a lot of women, when they come to express themselves to the men in their lives, especially around problems, what they're wanting is to be seen, felt, heard, and understood. They want intimacy in that moment, and they want understanding. They want validation, right? They don't want a man to just sort of rush to a snap decision and be done with it. And men are, are real good problem solvers. So usually when a woman comes to them with anything, they're like, all right, we're going to fix it. Then it's done. And you're like, wait, wait, wait. You know? <laughs> yeah. So that would be something I think men don't understand about women. This is so good, by the way. It's so, so, so true. What, is there something that men, uh, women often get wrong about men? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. A lot of things. Oh God, here we go again. Okay. To start with what, one of the things that women don't understand about men is that they need desperately to feel a place in a woman's life. And we as, as women are going in the whole opposite direction right now. I mean, there's so much emphasis and has been since the 1960s on you don't need a man. You can do what a man does. You know, dare I say you can do it even better. And it's like the space where a man occupied in a woman's life is closing off and closing off. And it's a recipe for disaster, if you want my honest truth. A man needs to feel as if he is serving a, a role in her life that is deeply valued and that there's a need for him. So when women need to create that place, which is 
when I'm working with women one-on-one, -on -one, one of the things that I really love to do with them is to, to make sure that if a man tries to come in and support in some way, you say yes to that. So if a man offers you his hand, you know, when you're stepping out of a taxi or something, take it. I, it's like, you know, the space that we are, have men in is like a lose-lose. They can't win right now. They don't know how to show up as men, but we're like, oh, we don't like you. You're little, like, you're basically turning into little girls right now is sort of the MO that I feel from women. Um, so that's the one thing that I would say. Another thing that I would say is, oh, if, a, so let's say you've got like a man, you've got some men that don't really want to be relied on and they don't really want to be committed. So what I'm about to say, you got to take that group of men out of the picture, but for the majority of men, confidence is what is going to make them show up for you better. And so that means that criticism is an absolute killer. Now, this isn't to say that when women run into a situation with a man that they don't like what's going on, they shouldn't tell a guy. Like, honesty is a very important part of a relationship. However, what this means is you have to get into a relationship with a man based on who he is today. Because if, you, if there's a lot about who he is today to criticize, his confidence is going to go down. He's going to withdraw and not show up for you. And I, I watch, quite frankly, I watch women do the exact opposite of this. Like... It is a female condition at this point to be like, I got into a relationship with him because of all of his potential. He was just going to turn into such a great guy. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> what, what, if he, what if he doesn't? What if he doesn't ever change? Honestly, are you going to criticize him if he stays the way that he is? If so, don't even consider that relationship because it's a recipe for failure. Um, another thing I think women should understand about men is they're actually terrible at multitasking. Like I need to tell you guys that. Um, <laughs> So there's a practice that that can be good where where you practice essentially telling a guy directly when you need their full attention and the man practices saying when he's on something else and essentially reassuring you this is the time that I'm going to give you my full attention so that I can actually be on top of whatever it is you're wanting me to be on top of. In that same vein, something I also love to teach women to do with men is to realize how directly they need to be spoken to. Like, you know, this sort of airy, fairy, creative, weird way that we go about talking with each other sometimes. I think that still should be changed with women, but men literally can't keep up with it. So with men, I, I just wish women understood how much they want you to look at it and be like, I need attention. Not like, look, I'm going to go put on laundry and like traipse around in case I might be able to get you to look at me. Something like that, right? We're women are like masters of going behind um behind the you know the back door to try to get what we want and it doesn't work with men like you'd literally be like no i don't like it and this is why this is what i want from you and this is why just bam you know so much easier i love yeah. that and then the last thing i would offer is that men care less about what you look like than you think i mean i i watch women just like try so hard every day to get every single aspect of themselves perfect and you know a man is responding much more to a woman's energy and much more to her level of confidence and you know, it's more likely that you, you spent, you know, $500 in that new haircut and you walk in, you're like, oh my God, did you notice? And they're going to be like, no, new no. boots? Yeah. <laughs> but I, why I feel like this is important is because there's a kind of energy, when you realize this, there's a kind of energy that comes up in you that's a lot more able to be at ease in a man's presence. And a man really enjoys that. He doesn't like feeling like he's on ice all the time. And I feel like when we are, are you know, obsessive compulsive about making sure we look as perfect as possible, we're getting ourselves into an energy that's actually a put off. It, it creates a huge amount of tension and anxiety that's completely unnecessary. <laughs> These are so good. Teal, I wanted to ask you about gender. You know, there seems to be a big de debate around gender at this time. And just curious if you feel there's an ulterior, you know, ulterior motive around this topic. Oh, we're going to go there, are we? All right. Um, yeah, it's bad. I, I'm, I struggle with this one because obviously the people who have been suffering in society for so many years because of their you know gender conflicts, I understand that what's happening within the world is an improvement for them. While at the same time, it's like the fact that it's an improvement for them is being sort of used as, as a method f uh, with which entities that don't really have our best interests at mind are going to grab control. 
So the ulterior motive, honestly, behind all of this is to first and foremost, get rid of the man. So we're in the past, what has made nations strong is that, you know, the masculine is in a strong enough place to step up and stand against, right? So when you've got authoritarian governments that are coming in or external forces that are coming in, you are essentially relying upon your warriors to step up and set a boundary about what gets to happen, doesn't get to happen. In this war, we're essentially eradicating the man and therefore they will, there will be nobody to defend us at that point. It's a very controllable society. That's number one. Um, number two is by supporting these advances in, in things like gender equality, and even we could say erasing it all together, <laughs> right? Um, autocratic governments, they put the spotlight on, you know, the area that's widely seen as linked to democracy, when in fact, they're taking the focus away from their persistent authoritarian practices. Mm. So that is what I keep seeing as the ulterior motive behind this, you know, thing around gender. And it's scaring the crap out of me because most of the people who are caught up in the surface aspect of that argument don't understand that really scary underlying underpinning of what is going on here and so there it's like you're falling right into the lion's mouth thanks for addressing you know such a complex topic with so much compassion and clarity uh, it's really helpful to hear your perspective and you know i feel like it kind of ties into the topic of wokeism mm -hmm. you know kind of how we see that playing out in the collective do you feel like wokeism has a place in our spiritual awakening i hate wokeism oh god it's the opposite of awakening in every way i'm sorry you're like hit this is a i would love to be like i'm coming at you from an objective standpoint no this really irritates me it's become very frustrating honestly and, and let's just get personal before we go sort of high level on this so me as a, as a spiritual teacher of sorts or awakening teacher coming into this world trying to get people to become more and more conscious it was in fact 10 times easier to work with the consciousness that people had before it's become harder and harder because of wokeism irony sweet irony you know um <laughs> Yeah, what I see in the world is just like this constant virtue single, like signaling left and right and, and you know, essentially complete intolerance. This is something that blows my mind, is you've got sort of the, the left, super leftist ideologies, which in theory would be the most tolerant, that are in fact the most intolerant of all. Like right now, this looks more autocratic than anything where there is it's no free speech if you're going to say these things okay well that's an interesting methodology of control it's now we're going to control what you can and can't show people oh now you're going to get canceled unless you agree with this narrative i'm, I'm like wait 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 wow this is just like a reverse day mm -hmm. right and but but just like this is what scares me when people are in that type of a mentality that is that rigid they don't seem to see how they're the very same as the opposite. You know, we back in the day, I'll just give you an example. Back in the day, you've got, you know, the people who they just will not, like it's, they're shut down and will not consider that somebody that is not fitting into this box has an opinion to share. Me, Okay, well, guess what? It's the same on the other side when you're like, unless you agree with these things, nobody wants to listen to you. Okay, it's the same thing, you guys. Yeah, and each side will say, yeah, but I'm the one that's right. Mm -hmm. And I'm the one that's good. Okay. <laughs> then on top of that, you've got an attachment to moral superiority on a level that is blowing my mind. I mean, it is literally just this canvas for the ego to be like, da, 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 da. <laughs> you know? Um, all right, well, that's going to make it so you don't see any of this, 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 this about you and what you're doing. So we're falling and falling and falling into this complete ignorance and making ourselves very vulnerable by doing so. Um, I don't like, I don't like this. I don't like this movement at all. I don't like where we are as a world right now with this wokeism thing. What I will say is that even though it has led us further and further into unconsciousness, my hope here is that people are going to get so irritated by this 
that all of a sudden there's this mass desiring for authenticity because wokeism is the opposite of authenticity you know you know wokeism is like I'm going to put Black Lives Matter on my lawn, despite the fact that on a subconscious level, what we all need to actually look at is the fact that when a Black person passes your car, you lock the door. So, I mean, that would be a much more fruitful thing to be doing, is for all of us to really be looking, genuinely looking at it, not being like, no, it's not there. No, it is. Um, so I'm hoping that it's, there's a swing. I'm hoping the swing that happens is like people being like, actually, no, we're going to be honest. And we're, we want freedoms, you know? Yes. Yeah. Teal, you've shared poignant forecasts for, you know, what's happening energetically. And it definitely feels as though we're in such a transformational crossroads in society. I'd love to hear from your perspective what you feel like is happening energetically and, you know, any predictions for the next year or two. I'm about to release my my predictions thing. Awesome. Um, yeah, I don't know anybody who's actually uh, surfing this situation well. Even the people who are the most adept at surfing these situations on an energetic level. We are in a pressure cooker that is blowing my mind. Um, basically, what's happening right now is that, going full circle to how we started this conversation, we're in a time period where it's not an option anymore for anybody to have even the perception that they get to escape from whatever it is that they're trying to avoid. Everything that we're trying to avoid, every aversion that we have is going to be boom, right up in our face to deal with and to face. On another level, we're being put in a position where it is no longer a luxury that we have to play a zero-sum game. So the mastery of relationships for humanity is no longer just an option for us. It's literally a have to, and we're going to be forced into it. What scares me is that we're being forced into that by virtue of the consequences that we're going to experience as a result of you know, playing the zero-sum game in the relationships with people, whether it's this nation against this nation or this group of people against this group of people or this individual against this individual. The more zero-sum games we play, the higher the consequences right now. And if we don't have the, the foresight to step back and really like zoom forward into like what could be the potential consequences of doing this, we're, we are going to learn the hard way you can't do this in a closed system. I mean, it's it's a little bit funny when you when you think about zooming out and looking at Earth as this tiny little marble which is like a, it's like an insular system. Well, it's easy to see then in this web of life on earth that if you damage another part of this web, it's going to come back. Like you can't do it without, you can't cause harm to something else without damaging a part of yourself. And you see this playing out not only within humanity, but also our relationship with the earth itself. I mean, environmental issues are just going to get worse and worse and worse. Why? Because we keep playing a zero sum game. And even those of us that care are watching ourselves in this situation. We're like, what am I supposed to do? Like, life is too hard to make sure that I'm growing my own food. And I'm taking, oh, God, I forgot my bags again, you know, going to the grocery store. So I think a lot of us are going to be waking up to the fact that the entire system itself that we've created is set up on a zero-sum game against something. And that's going to have to change really aggressively. So that's in a nutshell what we're what we're dealing with. Um Next year, really big, there's going to be some really big themes. Um, one of those big themes is going to be the ocean. In fact, the majority of, of I think, our conservation efforts need to swing towards the ocean this in this upcoming year. Um, on top of that, there's a lot of potentials for landslides. And on top of that, there's going to be a huge theme around decision making. I, I, you know, so anybody who's got issues with decisions, beware. Next year is going to be an entertaining one. Um, we're going to be in decisions, 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 and those decisions are going to dictate so much about the the course of humanity and the course of our lives as individuals. It's a very, it's a year that I would consider to be like a pivotal year, where, where what we decide in this upcoming year dictates so many of the years to follow. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try to make, I'm going to, when I do this final do thing that I do at the end of every year, I'm going to make this make sense for people so they feel empowered around it rather than panicked. But so excited to tune into that. Um, so many questions I can, you know, go from there, but how do you feel loneliness plays into the crisis that we're moving through? Well, loneliness is ultimately the perception of separation. 
that's what causes it. The perception of separation causes the sensation of loneliness. And I'm not just talking about separation from others that are external to us. I'm talking the process of internal separation as well. When we experience adverse events, traumas, we split our psyche so that we've got aspects that keep us safe and aspects of us that are vulnerable that are being kept safe by those parts. Now, there's a gap between these two. There's a separation. That separation internally creates the perception of loneliness and creates all kinds of dysfunctional dynamics in our behavior, which then enhances the pain outside in the world. So this perception of separation that we have not only internally, but also with other things in the world is making it so that we think we can do something to harm another without simultaneously harming ourselves. Ergo, crime, war, poverty dynamics. I mean, everything that we could essentially shine a spotlight on in the world that we've created especially within humanity certainly within environmental crisis it boils down to separation and thus loneliness when you talk about narcissism you know it just seems as though as human beings we're innately wired for compassion and love and yet narcissism is pervasive i'm just curious how it originally replicated and how it came to be narcissism began to become a real problem based on environments so for this we got to look back at the origin of our species our species started to get into situations especially when we started to migrate that were really adverse to the original conditions that made our species survive so you could look at for, for millions of years, you've got a species where the survival is really about this very dynamic um, mutual need meeting type relationship. Then you move into an environment where it's much more about survival. So innately people are much more focused on themselves. And then when each being is born into that type of a dynamic, it's more like being born into a reptile type dynamic than a mammal type dynamic. Why, what I mean by a reptile dynamic is when, when reptiles, for the most part, have babies, it's not like there's a, a high degree of caretaking. Everybody's pretty much out for their own, for their own, right? And so the genesis of narcissism, even though we could look that far back, in a, in a basic family, it's the genesis is that. It's I'm born into a family where the gaslight actually is that we're all here for each other. We may be using those words. We may live under the same roof, but the reality is people in that household are pretty much focused on themselves and their own needs even even if to the detriment of others that's why we call it a dysfunctional you know family dynamic so when when a person in a family system is focused on their own best interests even if it creates consequences for others then it puts every other person in that dynamic in that situation of oh no this is a shark pit so how am i going to keep myself alive so self preservation is in fact what rules the day in that environment that's why it keeps perpetuating because each new being that is born into that dynamic has to go oh no am i going to fight for myself or am i going to find any way that i can to let go of myself so that so that i can make that person please so that i can get my needs met and there's all these strategies that we start to employ that are self-centered strategies narcissistic strategies in fact even if they don't look like it because believe me self-sacrifice doesn't look like a narcissistic behavior but it's a profoundly narcissistic behavior we employ all these behaviors that are narcissistic so as to survive in this situation so, I mean, it's not until we go, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm done with this. I'm going to help the other members of the system, especially the young ones, feel as if I am there with them. I am there for them. I understand them. I feel them. I hear them. I'm going to be responsive to their pain. And so it feels like a dynamic relationship. It's not until we make that shift that we're going to break out of this perpetual narcissistic <laughs> snowball that we've been in for so long. It's interesting that you brought up self-sacrifice. You've created so much content. And um, you know, one of my favorite videos of yours is on covert boundaries. And I'd love if you could just touch on that. You know, it's been such a, a huge lesson of mine in this lifetime. And I'd love if you could share just how we begin to develop these covert strategies. Well, okay, so in in a family system like that where everybody's out for themselves you're essentially being raised in a shark pit even if what it looks like on the surface is different right 
so when you're, you're born of that type of situation on an emotional level or a physical level or whatever, you have to find a way to keep yourself safe. What you'll notice is that when it comes to keeping yourself safe, you can't escape a childhood home. That's what people don't get. Like we, when I say childhood is a prison, people go, oh my God, no, it's not. No, it is. It actually is. Because a child can't go run away. They will be brought right back. So unless that family is so bad that authorities are like, we're going to take the kid away from you, you're stuck in whatever home you're in. So that means you are a captive by definition. So your happiness in childhood is down to the so the benevolence of your keepers, basically. <laughs> so either it's like, oh, it's just a heaven because I can trust these people to, you know, like gods of my universe to be there for me and to make it so that I'm safe and my needs are met. And either you feel that way or you're like, you know what? I'm screwed. I'm screwed here. My pain's not going to move people. Um, I'm basically being used for whatever the other people in this, this circumstance want. And so because running away is not an option, which is one way that people stay safe, you have two other options, right? Because you can't stay frozen your whole life. Your two other options are you fawn or you fight. So fighting, that's self-explanatory. We all have that person in the family that's like, you know what? I can find no reasonable way to endear myself to this family. And so they're the family problem. This is the kid that's always like, <laughs> you know, um, or you fawn. So what we're discussing really is the fawning behavior. It's to stay safe within a social context, specifically by pleasing somebody else or employing some way to meet another person's needs so that you can essentially get your own needs met. Or to, you know, when we kind of talk about setting a boundary, like what you're talking about, it's we can say no, but not directly. Mm -hmm. We can say no in a way that doesn't get us in trouble, right? Okay, so uh, covert boundaries. Um, let's, let's just go really not politically correct. Um, so many people who are overweight, they were put in the, the situation where fawning was the way that they endeared themselves to their parents and therefore stayed safe. And so they became kind of the, the pleaser or the need meter. Now, that's an unsafe situation because it feels like you're getting enmeshed. Enmeshment trauma is what comes out of that. Mm -hmm. So you would see somebody build up actually layers of fat as a way of sort of keeping themselves separate from the thing that's trying to engulf them, the thing that will not recognize any truths about them. Which is one reason why when you're working with people around weight loss, it is so hard for them to let go of the weight because on an emotional level, that's the covert boundary. That's the, but this is my only way to buffer myself from the world. That's just one example. I mean, there's there's so many examples we could come up with of, of you know, ways that people don't directly express a, a yes or a no they just kind of like you know um, another one would be okay i'll get, just give you another one so let, let's say that you couldn't meet any of your needs and a boundary of yours is i need to be caretaken or i need support i need support that's a good one okay so i need support i'm that's a boundary of mine right because it's a personal truth which is all a boundary is um I can't actually ask for support directly. And so now what I'm going to do to covertly get that need met is I'm going to develop an illness or feign one. So really we're looking at all these manipulative ways to, to meet our needs or to say no, or, you know, and it's just rampant. I mean, it's so rampant within society because as children, we weren't, in a situation, which we need to be, where it's a back and forth relationship, where a kid can come up and say, this doesn't feel good to me. And we can go, oh, I don't like it when things don't feel good to you. But I also need to teach you about the realities of life. So let me show you that I'm workable. And therefore, you're safe with me. We weren't in those situations. So so we're constantly placating or you know, constantly fighting for our survival against the people who we live with or you know, a plethora of all of these dysfunctional dynamics that I'm decoding and exposing all day long. <laughs> yeah, such great examples. How have you found that motherhood has, you know, changed uh, those patterns and like, how have you approached the role of, of being a mother? Well, I started by throwing everything out the window and it was the smartest thing I ever did. 
I think so much of us, we feel like disloyal to our parents if we if we don't in some way kind of, you know, raise our kid the way that we were raised. And that's if we're conscious. I mean, if we're not conscious, it's just like, you know, this is the way that I was raised. And so I'm just doing it because that's all I've seen. I think one of the smartest things you can do as a parent, and it's definitely what I did, and I think was the greatest decision ever, was to just take all the things that I heard about motherhood from my, you know, parents, or especially my mother, and everything that I saw, and just went, Bleh. I don't know. Now, by throwing everything out and being like, I don't know, I started to be really curious about different ideologies. You know, what are different experts saying? If they disagree, what is their argument for disagreeing? You know, in my childhood, what harmed me? And therefore, I want to do the opposite of. But what is the harm in swinging the pendulum so far to the opposite? And what started to come out of it was, you know, this, this like, almost like building from scratch this new picture of what I wanted motherhood to look like. But to be able to do that correctly, I had to admit to a lot of really painful things. Pain, painful things that as women, we're not allowed to admit to. And, you know, one of those things for me was definitely, and it was after my son was about three years old, admitting to the fact that I, I'm not the type of person that can make my entire life about my kids. I can't do it. And in fact, you know, sitting there for a long time with myself, just being like, you know, does this mean I shouldn't have kids? Like genuinely, should this mean that I don't have kids? Should we be living in a giver society where you've got women who have them and women that raise them? I mean, I went way outside the box. And what I decided, like what I landed on is it's so incredibly important to be able to perceive the needs that the child has and to perceive your needs and to find really creative ways to make those two things work together. And I mean, really creative. So, you know, one way that I feel like women are going to go towards really great things in the future is when they really break these paradigms, because there's so many paradigms that are placed on women. Like, if you're going to be a good mom, it has to look like this, but no reasonable woman can actually make it work within that, you know, <laughs> box that they've been put in. So when they start to break those boxes and start to get creative in a way that meets their own needs and their child's needs at the same time, then it allows for a lot more functional relationship and a lot more smooth parenting experience. Motherhood has been so profound. I don't have words like... <laughs> I don't have words. I'm one of those people where I know it hurts people that don't have children, you know, to hear you will, there's a, there's a, a level of love you will know with your child that you cannot know unless you have a child. And I a hundred percent believe that mm. it's an experience that is out of this universe and nobody can prepare you. I don't care what anybody tries to say. <laughs> yeah. I want to shift gears to ask you a few kind of personal questions. I'd love to hear um a little bit about your morning routine oh well i've got a kid so it's pretty straightforward um okay so in the morning i wake up with somatic meditation i do that to land with myself so somatic meditation is essentially where you're using whatever sensations are happening in the body soma as a point to completely focus on so you're focusing all your energy on on that sensation which may come with colors may come with textures may come with insights that are kind of like words or knowing you might relate to them as internal thoughts images and you're literally just sitting there observing them that's my first touching base with the self then when it's time for my son to wake up i'm making breakfast and i'm usually making a tea for myself i'm a complete tea freak so i'm doing tea and then we sit down every morning i make it a point to spend time with him um this is a way that as a working mom which by the way has been a disaster <laughs> there's been nothing more painful i think in my life than the experience of trying to do an international business in a massive career at the same time as being a mom. But um, obviously because I'm not, I'm not like, you know, the mother who can be there with him all day, every day, you know, it's been very important for me to do launching and landings with my son. So in the morning, I, there's like a block of an hour before he goes to school and I always spend that hour with him. So I'll make food for him and make tea for myself and we'll sit there watching a cooking show specifically because it's like a love thing that we share. Mm -hmm. um, so usually we start our mornings with Great British Bake Off because let's be honest, it's the best show in history. <laughs> <laughs> and then I take him to school and after we, you know he goes to school, I'm going to focus on whatever work project that I have. What do you feel creates a fulfilling life? Living in alignment with your values. So a value is what you as a person consider to be the most important. And believe me, there ends up being a rank to what you believe to be the most important. But 
the people who are not fulfilled in life are the people who are not living according to their actual values. And so many people aren't They're They're kind of like getting torn back and forth where on a subconscious level, they will act according to their values, even though, you know, they think they should be doing something different or to the opposite, they'll vacillate and act on what they think their values should be regardless of what they actually are. So a fulfilling life is down to becoming completely aware of and conscious of what your actual values are. And then, your actions, thoughts, and words need to be aligned with those values. Something that I think that's important to understand about values and about fulfillment in life is that there is a level that's actually above just joy or just happiness. There's a level of meaning and purpose in in living according to your values that has more strength than joy and happiness because we all know that when we are doing what's really important, we run into challenges those challenges will not make you happy. Like it's not going to make you happy. It will happen. And you're going to be like, why did I even get into this? Now, if you're living according to what really matters to you, you will be able to pull through those challenges rather than just be like, well, it doesn't make me happy. And so I'm going to switch gears. So I feel like living according to your values puts you in touch with that more fulfilling layer under just enjoyment. That's deeper than just enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And it makes it so that, you know, by the time you die, you look back at your life and you go, yeah. <laughs> what are you most excited about for the future? I'm actually most excited about people starting to live in a way that's more conducive to what's biologically healthy for people. What I have watched since the beginning of humanity is this graduation away from all of the things that are conducive to human health. That means the structure of the way that we live with each other. We should never have been living in single family households, for example. Um, the way that we process food. I mean, we essentially, our entire biological organism is designed for things like, oh, you know, my brain really likes sugar. Why? Because it's so rare. Okay, so now we've got this food industry that manufactures everything for taste, but it's so bad for us at this point that no part of us was meant to be taking it in this way um so that's just two examples there's so many examples of the ways that we've graduated away from what's healthy and what i see for humanity in the future is that we're going to be doing the opposite more and more we're waking up to like wait 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 we can't do this like none of us are thriving we can't do it and that's going to put a lot of pressure on us to be like all right we're breaking the mold what does work is it you know is it doing food in a totally different way in communities is it we're going to live in you know multi-person households rather than as single family units is it oh wait we got to change the entire way that education went because let's face it all of us went to school and then ended up feeling worse about ourselves and spending years focused on what we suck at rather than being able to specialize early it's just all of these radical changes that are more in alignment with human health are going to happen once we start going in the in that direction and i'm pretty excited for you know the way that the structure of society is going to change i mean when you've got healthier people you've just it's like the well-being of everything around that that person or that group of people is going to thrive that includes the environment they live in as well do you feel promising about humanity most days <laughs> i don't know i it's kind of i go i go back and forth i think like most people where I see some of the stuff that we're lining up with in the short term, because I think it has to get worse for most people to realize that it's not working for them. A lot of people who are awake are probably listening to this like, no, I know it's not working. It hasn't worked for me for years. But um, some people are still kind of making the dysfunction work for them. And so I feel a little bit of doom when I look at the kind of consequences that have to happen to make the totality of humanity be like, wait, wait, we got to go back to the drawing boards. But beyond that, I have a, a high degree of hope. So it's like short term, not much hope, long term, a lot of hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure most people know where to find you. If not, it's tealswan.com. You have an incredible YouTube channel. Is there anything that's coming up on the horizon that people can participate in? Well, I have a curveball that's coming up in January um, at my retreat center in Costa Rica, Amazing. which is incredibly intense. And then my team is actually getting together uh, probably in the next two weeks to set up the entire schedule for the next year, but there will definitely be several tours in different countries around the world. So I would definitely, if you go to tealswan.com and you just click on events, you can keep up to date. Not that I'm going to be quiet about it on social media either when we make our 
mind up about what it is that we're doing. <laughs> awesome. Any final words of wisdom that you'd like to leave listeners with? Hmm. Well, we're coming up on Christmas time, so you know, I've been watching people in the in the last weeks just feel really overwhelmed around the holidays and I think one of the most important things that you can do around this time period is to really figure out what it is that you want the holiday to be about and to start to craft the holidays around specifically what matters to you most. So we're back to the values thing, right? What's interesting is that I, f I find people just following tradition, almost blindly following tradition, even if they hate it and not realizing that you can get in the driver's seat in terms of how any specific holiday looks like for you. And it's especially important to do if you're not really getting along with your family very well, because <laughs> I mean, it's, the holidays represents this time where we sort of get carried in the undertow of the family dynamics that we've been caught in for our whole entire life. And it's so easy to just get swept up in it and almost play this passive backseat role to it rather than being like, you know what, if I was going to design this time period the way that I wanted to design it, so it looked exactly like the things that I loved the most, what would I be doing each day? And then really putting energy into doing that. Um, I love Christmas. It's a little, I'm like such a Christmas freak. I could be like a little elf myself. It's like my favorite <laughs> time of year. Why? Because I love gifts so much. So for me, you know, taking control of the holiday looks like I have so much fun just picking out the perfect gifts for people, but that may not be something that floats somebody else's boat. They may love cookie decoration or another person might just be like, you know what? Christmas is this time where we celebrate the light essentially returning to earth. So, you know, if I was going to celebrate the light returning to earth, what might that look like? Does it look like meditating with a candle, taking light much more literally? Or does it look like, you know, what is light? Metaphorically, it could be kindness. Okay, well, I want, what I'm going to do this week is go out and do a random act of kindness. I would love to see, and I think my advice to people would be during this time period to be much more in the driver's seat and much more proactive about the way that you want holidays to look like and not just think that they have to look the way that they have looked because of tradition. I guess this all rounds up to, throughout this entire you know time that we've spent together, it rounds up to break the paradigm. Mm -hmm. You know, We're in a time period where the mold hasn't been working very well for any of us. So don't be afraid to just like pop it and do something completely radically new. Yes. I love that. Teal, this has been such a fun and enlightening conversation. I just have so much gratitude. Thank you for, for being here and sharing with us today. Thank you. It's been wonderful to be here with you guys.